We're talking about revolution at the end of the day, and revolutions start individually by individual people making those changes. And so, again, it, it, it comes to us to have the bravery and the tenacity uh, to make the change. And courage. Absolutely. You know, if, uh, if you're going against the norms, the family norms, the social norms, the community norms, that takes courage. You, know? uh, you, could, you could get a lot of pushback from people. That was Brian Warburg, and you're listening to The Regenerative Journey. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and internationally, and their continuing connection to country, culture, community, land, sea and sky. And we pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. G'day, I'm your host Charlie Arnott, an 8th generational Australian regenerative farmer. And in this podcast series, I'll be diving deep and exploring my guests' unique perspectives on the world so you can apply their experience and knowledge to cultivate your own transition to a more regenerative way of life. Welcome to The Regenerative Journey with your host, Charlie Arnott. G'day. This episode of The Regenerative Journey is actually a bit of a um, combination, or compilation I should say, of a number of interviews I did, short interviews I did at the 2021 uh, Farming Matters conference. It was in Albury on the 29th and 30th of March. Hang on, I'm on the right month? Yes, March it was. Time is flying by. Um, and I attended that and it was a wonderful conference put on by Land and Market team. Um, and Tony Hill, who's my first guest, is the uh, executive chair of Land and Market. If you don't know about them, look them up. It'll be in the show notes. Um, he is the exec- executive chair um, of Land and Market and one of the key organisers of the conference and having had to um, postpone it from last year, given the whole COVID show, his team and many others pushed on and put on a, a, a rip-roaring conference um, this year. and It was fantastic. So I just grabbed who I could, some of the presenters and, and others who weren't actually presenting, but that I know and uh, knew could, uh, could you know, hold the conversation for a good 10, 15 minutes. Um, plenty of them, uh, grabbed them and, and, and put this together. So this is actually part one. The first interview was with Tony Hill, as I've just um, just mentioned, Tony's role with Land and Market. Second was Peter Richardson, who's actually the CEO of My Grazing. And if you haven't heard of them, it'll be in the show notes as well. A grazing management um a piece of software and tool which we use, and um, Peter uh, was presented. So I had a chat about him about myo grazing and sort of the, the benefits of it, which are many. Um, then we had Brian Wahlberg, who is he's actually sort of he's part of Land and Market as well um, on the board, and wonderful holistic management educator, uh, inside outside management is his business, and he is just prolific in the um, holistic management scene. A lovely, lovely bloke. So I had a good chat with him. And then um, Rachel Ward, who many of you may already know, I did interview Rachel um, uh, previously for um, a proper uh, episode of The Regenerative Journey, and I caught up with Rachel there um, just to catch up on what she was up to, a few projects she's been working on, which uh, we talk about. So you'll just have to listen to find out. And just before we jump into the interview, I just want to let you know and remind you that we will be, Hamish Mackay and I will be down in South Australia uh, with all those wonderful crow editors down there uh, at Barossa, the Barossa Valley on the 3rd and 4th of May at the Alkina Wine Estate there with Dan and Amelia and all those wonderful people. Um, now, just to make a note of that, we are just talking about how biodynamics applies to wine uh, and, and viticulture. It is about horticulture. It's about broad acres. It's about small-scale garden. It's whatever you want to however you want to um, apply biodynamics to your world and your life. So there on the 3rd and 4th of May in the Barossa Valley at the uh, um, Alkina um, Wine Estate and on the 7th and uh, – sorry, 6th and 7th of May, that's the, later in that same week at McLaren Vale at Gem Tree Wines there with Melissa and Michael um, who produce some amazing wines as it does the um, Alkina Estate. So just to reinforce that, you don't have to be a wine grower – you might want to be a grape eater, but not a wine grower or a winemaker, to come to these courses down there in South Australia. They are open to everyone. So spread the news far and wide. We'd love to see you there. Uh, tickets available on charliearnett.com.au. 
and uh, um, get all the details and tickets there. Love to see you down in South Australia. Cannot wait to get down there and uh, haven't been there for a while, so looking forward to it. But, uh, look, I hope you enjoy this um, combo uh, episode as much as I did putting it together. It was a bit of a last-minute thing, but it, uh, I think it actually worked really well and um, good to grab some insight and snippets from people um, at the conference. And I uh, hope you enjoy it, because I certainly did. G'day. Um, I am coming to you from Albury, sunny Albury, at the Entertainment Centre here uh, at the Farming Matters, the, the Land Market uh, Holistic Management Savory Institute. It's a big, it's a mouthful, Tony. Um, conference here and I am putting together a few little uh, snippets from some of the presenters and other people here at the conference today and I've been lucky enough to grab Tony Hill um, who is one of the linchpins behind the conference and uh, tirelessly getting through the cancellation of last year's conference and he's he's um, he's uh, he's fronted up again this year. Tony, welcome. It's, it's, it's appropriate that you're kicking off our little um, a little uh, oh, what am I doing? collection of interviewees here. How are you going? Absolutely. Uh, so excited, I think, is the word <laughs> for that. Uh, excited to be finally getting there. And um, just to correct you on one point, we never actually cancelled last year. We postponed. <gasps> we postponed it. And, and <laughs> over that, you know, I have never been in this situation with an inaugural conference. Um, we're branding this as... Australia's discussion of regenerative agriculture, a central place where everybody can come, express their views, people can listen, make their own choices. We're not trying to push any messages down anybody's throat. We know that there's fantastic interest in regenerative agriculture and that's why we took the decision to postpone. Mm. And over that 12 months, so many of the delegates, all of the sponsors, all of the speakers, they've all stayed with us for that journey. It's fantastic, mate. And there's um, a few of our – Alan Savory is currently um, presenting via um, – or digitally. Remotely. Remote, yeah. <laughs> that's the word. I'm so not in the, in the lingo. Remotely, which is wonderful. Um, and any, I guess any of the other international speakers that might have been here, the, the slots have been filled by, by locals. Um, Tony uh, and, a, and a wonderful crowd of people there, 300 um, uh, delegates uh, and hangers-on. Um, tell me um, – just, just, just expand a little bit more on why, or what, what you do. Like, just, just, just start there. For people who don't know Tony Hill, what, what are you, what are you doing, Tony? It's time to embark on a new mission. Mm. That, that's what I've been engaged with. Uh, I can't say that I was there for the early days of this journey for for a lot of people, and so we are building on some really heavy work by a lot of people here. What those people did. Uh, they, they work so hard to get awareness of holistic management and regenerative agriculture out there into the farming community. And that's reached thousands of farmers across Australia, farmers such as yourself, Charlie. And you've all taken your own creative approach to this. It's fantastic. It's a lovely story. But it's so much in-house amongst those farmers. And what I wanted to do was was embark on that new section of the journey where we do the really um, quite difficult task of reaching out to the wider community and saying everybody can get engaged in this. And uh, I might have heard this from you, but uh, but let me repeat it again. (laughs) You know, if you eat, you're engaged in farming because where does that food come from? Mm. And it turns out that we can no longer sit by and let Huge problems go unattended. It turns out also that farming can be a crucial part of the solution. I think the challenge has been that the wider community sees farming as almost an anathema to caring for the country, and and that's such a destructive thought, really, you know, to say that we have to make things worse in order to get our food. You know, that's an awful kind of... It's a, cra- it's a crazy future. notion, isn't it? Yeah. And so, so that's been the working implicit hypothesis of the community. And now we can turn that around if we can do this challenge of communicating our world. And so many people, you know, it's easy to sit in your own head, have your own ideas, convince yourself that you're right, uh, whatever. 
But to go that extra mile and say, no, I have to go out and talk to the wider community now about this and get them engaged. And I'd seen some people who were working on that, who'd had success of it, who'd had success at looking at their land. And I said, yes, this is possible if we do that hard work. And so the hall that we've got downstairs is full of a very wide group of people. You know, we haven't kind of sectioned it out. We haven't been didactic in this. And we've just catalyzed everybody around the idea that farming matters. The the, um, the, the delegate list, Tani, there's a few um, uh Few people there, I, I, I sense that aren't, aren't necessarily squarely in this space, which is great. There's just not like the preaching to the converted, and you know we're, we're seeing all the same faces and saying the same thing. Is it, was there an effort to sort of try and embrace those outside of the the circle, as it were? I've had a long experience of getting groups from a different perspective to try and talk to each other, and particularly in the space of scientific researchers trying to talk to people from the community and industry. And whenever you start that conversation in the room, it's almost like they've got nothing to say to each other. Mm. They're just so far apart in their thinking and their attitudes and their language that the communication doesn't work. And so uh, facilitating that discussion, moving it forward, giving people the confidence that they can talk. And so what we've done in this conference is said, yes, we'll have those farming voices. You know, we love to have them. But we've got other voices. We've got, from the Indigenous perspective, just had an amazing welcome to country uh, from an Indigenous perspective about how we nurture the seeds of the discussion. Mm. From the artistic perspective, how do artists look at this world? How can they open our eyes to see things differently and more interesting? But the really hard one is going to be the finance community and the, the consumer marketplace. Those people are very hard bitten and have to be. Their businesses have to survive. But in a sense, we also need to get them in touch with what this farming is all about. And uh, the sponsorships for this conference speak that language. Mm. So we have people here. We have probably the, the innovative you know, on-farm processing uh, company. We have Harris Farm Markets made us really serious if, effort, and I know you've worked with them now for about 18 months, getting their understanding of regenerative agriculture and how that feeds into their own business, but also their own personal concern about how these things work. Congratulations on that work, by the way. No, look, and Tony, I know you're involved as well, and you know, I think what Harris Farm has done really well is, is sort of um, uh, collaborate and... and, and um, uh, round up, you know, people in different parts of the industry that are coming together and working together, which is really a bit of a theme from the presenters that I've seen, you know, today that we we we, we will see today. Um, that it, it's just not farming. You've got the you've got the you've got the sort of the paddock plate end of the spectrum. You've got you've got Harris Farm in terms of retail. There's um, there is you know um, Harry Youngman is doing you know sort of the finance investment sector. So there's and this is the wonderful thing, is that it touches so many different industries, so many different professions and people's lives, you know, and as I keep banging on about, it's sort of inescapable, this, this sort of stuff. And if, as, you know, if you eat food, you probably kind of should be interested in, in this sort of conversation. Are there anyone that you're, any one of the, the presenters today, Tony, without being accused of, of favouritism, um, that you're really looking forward to, to, to hearing today? I want to Can I back. put you on the spot? <laughs> I want to get back and hear them all. Actually, Charlie, I'm, 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 you know, so fascinated in all the all the discussions, and uh, because we've we've had this process of kind of postponement for mm. twelve months, I feel as if I know them all, you know, quite well now because we've been talking to them a lot. Um, but again, what I want to hear is the way in which the ideas interact on the stage, how they join up and how we can get that conversation and, and bridge those gaps in language and understanding and interests in a way that's trusted for the future. And, and you know, the stakes are very high here. Totally. If we can get this to work, uh, we deal with those crucial issues. And, and just recently I've been coining the phrase of, you know, drought, fires, pestilence, floods, what's next? You know, we're all nervous. We've got to be prepared. And someone said, have we got to the last book of the Bible yet? But <laughs> what, what happened in that one? Was there like, <laughs> was there tornadoes, I mean, cyclones? 
<laughs> there could be more down the track. But that's great. But one of the points that I want to make is that while all of those all of those kind of natural disaster elements are all can all be seen as a failure of ecosystem processes. You know, whether they're in the atmosphere or whether in the ground or wherever they are, they can see be seen as a failure of ecosystem processes. And we might think, well, that's something that's external to people. In fact, it's a result of our management. And if we can get that conversation to go right, mm. whether it's at the farm level or whether it's out in the, in the business community or whether it's at the consumer level, there are opportunities here. And the one thing that we really want to do is give consumers the confidence that adjusting their spending patterns, they have to spend money on food. Mm. There's no two ways about that. But adjusting their spending patterns can help to solve these problems. And it's also not just, you know, buying fresh food, you know, fruit and, and, and regenerative products, say, from Harris Farm, uh, and, and that can often be met with, you know, when you challenge people on that, say, oh, it's too expensive. Well, let's look at the rest of the shopping trolley. Do we really need all that crap processed packaged food wrapped in plastic that is, you know, so it's not about just, you know, one for one replacement. It's just like let's just have a look at the whole thing. Back to your point about failure um, of ecosystem function. It's a it's a great point, Tony. You know, nature doesn't fail. Nature failing is not something that nature does. It's in it, it's it's a human induced so called failures as a result of decisions that you know some would might argue are you know, inappropriate for that resource base. And I talk to to Alan obviously you know on a regular basis, but you know. He explained to me that that's absolutely his focus now is to get that decision making at our local level for sure, mm. but at a national level, get it adjusted so that it can take account of these things and start to deal with the issues. Tony, conscious of your time, you need to get to the next bit. I think. Um, any thank yous you want to you want to anyone you want to plug while you've got the got the got the, the organising con- committee has been mm. doing an amazing job here, and you know all of them have worked very hard to keep this show on the road and produce the creative conference that's maxed out our attendance totally. uh, under the COVID rules. So um, those rules kept changing yeah, <laughs> and we followed closely, uh, but we've literally shoehorned people into every vacant seat that we had available. So that's been brilliant from the, the, the organising committee. Of course, the sponsors coming forward and um, an inaugural conference is always the most difficult one because it's in the uncertainty space. You know, when he got really anything to rely on. Having seen the success of this conference, I think we've got a platform to go forward. How often can we have that national discussion? Let's see what the future brings. Well, I think you've set, a, set, set the scene now, Tony. There'll be an expectation this will be every year or every six months, maybe every month <laughs> we can do this. <laughs> you have to move around the country. Tony, look, thanks for your time. Really appreciate it. I know you're busy today. It is the sort of culmination of... I guess at least two years worth of work or more, um, pulling all this together. So I, I trust your now that the thing is underway and the momentum is, um, you know, there's there's a there's inertia uh, now. Then you can your pulse maybe a little. So this you've just, overcome inertia. I should say your your pulse might be a little 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 more level now. Yes, I think I can stop worrying probably tomorrow <laughs> night. Because you know what. It's too late. <laughs> <laughs> now, just before we do go, yes. there is one thought I want to leave you with. Yep. And as we take this regenerative agriculture out into the marketplace, there are a lot of risks. Mm. It could be that that doesn't work out properly. We know that there's a lot of commercial forces out there that will want to get an angle on this and take their own place. And the word greenwashing has been used yesterday it's, it's businesses who don't want to put in the hard yard and understand what regenerative agriculture is and there's a risk that in the kind of frenzy of interest in the commercial world to try and move into this space, uh, consumers get a bit confused by the messages. Uh, even farmers, you know, it's a complex area when you get below it and we try and uh, produce the information for consumers in a way that's easy to understand. That's why we've pursued ecological outcome verification. I know you've been an enthusiastic supporter on your farm. That stuff gives us the robust information of whether those ecosystem processes are on the improve or if something more can be done. 
And that's wonderful that you're you, that that's that's a that that helps consumers and eaters, as I call them, you know, to to make those the sound decisions. It's not just based on some fancy stuff on a website or um, you know, the, as you say, the green potentially greenwashing uh, jargon and hoo ha that people might read and be exposed to. That there's actually some science around this, which is um, which is wonderful, and it gives people the opportunity to 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 buy with confidence, which is you know what you guys are promoting. It's what Harris Farm are promoting. And I guess what this whole conference is about, you know, every every decision that's made is based on, if not science, it's based on, you know, um, uh, informed decision making from, you know, all the way from the soil, food production, retailing, all the way to hit someone else's plate. So that's that's our part of the discussion. That's our contribution is creating that EOV. It's in no way trying to exclude anybody else from the discussion. It fits with so many perspectives on regenerative agriculture, it's really nice, but it does give the opportunity for businesses and consumers to have that confidence that what they're spending is doing good. Mm. And it's going back and it's, it's, it's contributing um, in many, many ways. Tony, thank you for contributing in many, many ways. I've stolen 15 minutes of your time now and um, I should let you get to the next, whatever the next activity you have planned, the next task that you have planned. So thank you for your time. Thank Great. you for putting in so much hard work for this conference and really excited to be here and um, being able to hopefully nab a number of other people for a quick 10-minute session and whack all this together for a future episode. Great to be talking to you, Charlie, and thanks so much for your efforts. We're back. I've, I've managed to wrangle Peter Richardson from My Grazing who did a wonderful presentation this morning, one of, one of a few. We're really rolling through the presentations Today, Peter, aren't we? They're, they're, it's 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 high rotation. Yeah, no, it's been fantastic. Um, good so, vibe too. A yeah, great vibe. Um, wonderful group of people, and so many um, wonderful messages and things that we can take home and implement, do, think about. Um, Peter, what I'm interested to know about is to explore um, your presentation today. Can you tell us sort of what the? I guess the thing that that struck me was your opening slide, which was basically. You know, I'll, I'll let you extrapolate somewhat, but it's uh, you know, if you were if you could make this much investment per hectare and get this much return, would that be a would, would that be a good thing? Can you just sort of put the put the put that in the context for our listeners? Yeah, well, I, I guess I just started with the proposition that um, let's just say there was this new product that came onto the market and you could put it onto your pasture for say eighty bucks a hectare. Uh, and it promised to give you a 30%, 26%, 30% increase in yield. And not only that, you put it on once and you get that increase in yield every year forever. I mean, how compelling would that be? I mean, you'd, you'd buy that product in a second. Buy the, uh, buy the truckload. Absolutely. And, and, and yet, in actual fact, that product is already available and it's, it's, it's a combination of wire and water and better grazing management and, and um, and, you know, all grazers can kind of achieve these kinds of outcomes just by working on their own on their own land. It's, it's, there's no magic. And so the, the so the combination of um, that infrastructure improvement, which you say is a capital capital input, you know, it's it's an investment in 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 the land and the landscape and in that business, combined with um, uh, grazing management, proper grazing management, can produce this. How did you how did you get to these figures? Where did that come from? Yeah, so um, a lot of people have been talking about this for a long time. There's no new great news here. Um, uh, the news is that with the advent of new digital tools, we're now in a position where we can actually capture the data to validate all of these claims. And so uh, in the example of our tool, my grazing, we've been capturing a huge database of um, grazers all around the world, and we've also been able to correlate where farmers have subdivided paddocks from one large paddock into a number of smaller paddocks and therefore increase the density uh, of the way that they're, they're grazing. And all the practitioners will tell you that if you can increase the gra- density of grazing and add and increase the corresponding rest period, then you will get a, a growth in the response of the pasture that will give you a higher yield. But nobody's really measured it at commercial scale. And the problem that we've had up until now is that researchers struggle to prove that this happens because if they go and do it at lab scale and look at individual um, uh, interventions, they struggle to sort of prove out these huge benefits that we're seeing anecdotally from the best practitioners. And so what we've done is been able to capture all of the data through these digital tools 
to be able to establish that this response does happen. And in fact, on average, you know, the, the answer is from our database of uh, paddocks that have been subdivided, on average, uh, our users are getting 26% uplift in pasture yield just simply through the, the act of subdivision and increased graze density, which is pretty awesome. And that doesn't take much you know, maths to work out how much um, extra, gra- extra grass that's, but that potentially is, which converts to extra kilos of meat, wool, and extra yeah, dollars. Yeah, pretty in much flows straight through. Yeah. yeah, flows straight through to the gross margin. Um, yep. Um, Peter, what um, and, and and the other good thing is, and you put up a map there of um, of the and little yellow dots, or, you know where the oh, data sorry, have been can taken. I just interrupt you? Yeah, there's totally. Thing, just following on from what we we're just mm. saying, there's another really key thing that comes out of this, and that is that um, uh, whilst these interventions, paddock subdivision and increased graze density, we can show gives this huge productivity benefit, the really the important thing that it, that comes with that is the improved soil condition and the improved land condition because effectively what you're doing is stimulating the growth of the plants and that's actually enhancing the quality of the soil. So it's not that you're running down the system to get higher yield. It's mm-hmm. quite the opposite. You're building it up and improving the soil and hence you get these great carbon stories. It's a compounding effect really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And so what it's all about is not just the short-term profitability about getting a better yield this year. It's Mm. about the long-term sustainable profit that you can achieve by gradually increasing your carrying capacity, by improving your soil, by encouraging plant growth through better grazing management. And you put up that map there. There was lots of yellow dots on on Australia and then in in northern Northern America as well. It's not as though you've just – there's a lot of data data points there, isn't there? Data, data, where are we – what do the Americans I'm, say? Actually, data. I know my my uh, my say? kids always correct me because I think I switch between data and data. I actually don't know that. <laughs> I always get ribbed uh, for saying data. Uh, I, so I get data, data, data right. points. Yeah. Um, so, but you've, there's a lot of them. It's not as though you know you've you've picked. Yes, yeah, so we've picked got up. we've got thousands. We've mm. got we've got thousands of farms all around the world from which we can draw upon this data, and so we can filter it down and do things that you can't do in a research lab because what we're doing is is measuring what the practitioners are mm. getting at scale, at commercial volumes in terms of real outcomes. And so I guess the only um, uh, proviso I put on this is we are not in a position to make claims about the, the, the causality here. So I'll leave it to others to talk about why this effect happens mm. and whether it's taking advantage of the sigmoid growth curve of the grass or... Um, um, uh, reducing selective browsing and increase increased pasture utilisation and the herd effect of trampling and all the rest of it. Uh, we're not attributing those mechanisms to the outcome. We're just saying that the outcome happens and mm. we can prove that the outcome happens. This is what you found. Yep. Um, Peter, any other? We've, we're halfway through the day. Um, any what, any any sort of standout without sort of being accused of favouritism? Any um, standout? Um, Presentations, any gold nuggets that you've sort of you've you've that have been unearthed for you today? Any any paradigms that have been blown out of the water? Uh, look, uh, t- to me, what t- to me, as I said before, I, I just really like the vibe. You've got a whole room full of people that have all seen the big picture, and the big picture is that we've got to do something about uh, improving the way that we farm, so that not only we get uh, better quality food. But we're doing it in a way that's going to um, improve improve the world, and that that means improving our soils and sequestering carbon and doing something about climate change. And the beautiful thing about all of this that's just coming out, uh, talk after talk today, is that it's additive. Uh, it's not subtractive. So, if you do the right thing by the land, you will get better production and you will be more profitable. But at the same time, you'll be doing something about climate change and you'll be, um, uh, you know, improving the long term value of your of your own land. It's just a beautiful win-win. You don't get to see it uh, very often. And I, I've always I love listening to Walter, Walter Yenna, um, and his, I mean, he had some notes there, but he was only referring to them every now and again. Yeah. I mean, the, the guy lives and breathes this stuff and not in a, not in a preachy way. He, I love the way that he's, he's, he's such an intelligent bloke. He's been at the science for so long, but he, the way he approaches it and the way he presents it is just so... Um, Understandable. It's really simple stuff, mm. and and that's the beauty of it. I think this is 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 not, it's not very hard to sort of comprehend, is it? It's like pretty no. basic stuff. No, it we're isn't. And to in fact, on the table. I find it incredibly frustrating as to how like Walter and uh, you know Terry McCoskey. Mm. These are people that are patient. 
They've been at this. <laughs> they've been at this for a long time. You know, like thank I, God they have. They I are totally tablet-based. admire them. Um, but I'm not. I'm not patient at all. I'm impatient, and and <laughs> you know, I'm sort of trying to figure out. Gee, how do we get this stuff to become mass adoption mm. rather than you know at some specialised conference uh, in Albury? Why isn't everybody doing this yeah. everywhere? And how can we get this mass adoption? And that's why I think it's so important to try and distill down some key messages around the economics of this stuff and the practicality of this stuff without getting too bogged down in the the complexities and the philosophies and all the, all the rest of it. it. You know, there's some there's some good hard facts here that mean that everybody should be doing it. It's pretty compelling, um, those facts. And I think that the you know, the more data that can be collected um uh on grazing management and how that then translates into the economics, the profitability, the increased yield, the number of kilos, you know, that's the stuff I think that is Top of the top of the list of what you know, farmers who are looking at this stuff for the first time or considering it, or even the ones who are bagging it out, but probably you know, secretly curious, you know, that they probably want to see to say, mm. okay, because that's the that's the thing I think the thing that's most fearful for people um, to look at this stuff, and you know, is well, what's it going to mean to the bottom line? I've still got a mortgage to pay, I've still mm. got school mm. fees, I've got all those things. So, you know, well done you guys for you know contributing to that data that is. Um, uh, now available and we can mm. start, you know, leave, as you said, leave it to other people to start correlating those things. But at least mm. there's a there's sort of like a there's a foundational start, you know, numbers there. Yeah, no, look, I, I see our mission is really we're not really about breakthroughs here. We're applying stuff that's been talked about for for decades. Um, but what we can what we can do as a as a software and services company is we can try to make it easier for everybody to kind of adopt the things that the very best guys have been doing. Uh, and, you know, that's that's what we're striving to do, just make it easier. Peter, thank you for your time. Thank you for your contribution to this um, conference and your, your, your you know, my grazing contribution to this space. It's, it's you know, it's it's another piece of the puzzle, isn't it, I think, just to for people to understand, you know, how to adapt um, this sort of um, style of farming. And, you know, and, and, and we've got a wonderful hall full of people out there, 300 plus that are keen to know more. So mm. thank you for your Great. contribution to the space. No worries. And let's work together and just try and get the message out there. Totally. Thanks, Peter. Good on you. <laughs> okay, my next victim, <laughs> Brian Warburg, <laughs> who's, who walked in saying he was exhausted, um, which is fine. That's just t- too bad. Um, Brian, <laughs> I'm going to turn, turn us down a little bit there. Um, Brian was the um, was spoke this morning, and it was fascinating. I always love listening to your chats. It was more, more not, not some well, chat's probably the wrong word. I just love your style, Brian, and your approach, and. I wanted to just one of the things that really stood out for me was your I guess the theme of your talk was you know, daring to be different. You turned up there with a sort of colourful shirt on, the hat and the socks sort of pulled out of your trousers and so on. And I think it was a really for obvious reasons, you know, it was a poignant, um, uh, uh, poignant point. There you go. There's a there's a tort- poignant point. Tautology. <laughs> Tautology. Yes. Rex Moss would be proud um, that. That you made there. Tell me, why is it important that we do dare to be different, Charlie? We, I mean, we've got to change. We've got to turn the ship around. Um, you know, we, we know we're heading in a direction that's that's not exciting. It's not, not certainly not good. So, uh, yeah, we all have to be different, and uh, we have to do things differently to to make that happen. And uh, you know, change is change is not easy for us. Um, yeah, we often incur ridicule. We yeah. Put people's backs up, um, and I suppose so. The real theme today was we have to make that change. We have to make change because, yeah, um, you know, for all the facts that I brought up this morning, where the environment is giving us all those indicators that things are going wrong, um, and it's up to us as individuals. I mean, we're not we're talking about revolution at the end of the day, and revolutions start individually by individual people making those changes. And so again, it it, it comes to us to have the bravery and the tenacity uh, to make the change. And courage. Absolutely. You know, if, uh, if you're going against the norms, the family norms, the social norms, the community norms, that takes courage. You, know? uh, you, could, you could get a lot of pushback from people. What do you say, Brian, to, you know, whether it's in your, 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 the courses, your HM courses, or just, you know, uh, comments people make or questions they put to you, you know, how, 
What, what are some of the, the I guess we call them tips or tricks that, 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 that can instill courage? You know, what do people have to be resolved about and, and really be clear about to, to push through the, that potential ridicule yeah. and push back? Yeah, I think um, having clear vision, you know, as I said today, people will do amazing stuff uh, if they become passionate. And it's almost impossible to become passionate about something you don't have a clear vision of. So it's getting people to really picture um, what their community needs to look like, what their environment has to look like. One of the exercises we do in classes is, is just get people to copy and paste and create a vision board of environments that inspire them and stimulate them, that, that make them feel good. And, you know, people will put all kinds of pictures up there from there and flower gardens to veggie patches to forests to waterfalls. And it's capturing the feelings that they get because our decisions are all driven by our feelings. And so just cutting out those pictures, putting them on the wall, actually really creates a connection between you and the environment and how the environment has to be to make you feel a certain way and to make you feel good about, about life. It's the juice, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It, 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 drives, it gives you the energy. Mm. Um, and once we have that energy <clears throat> excuse me, and that passion, um, then we'll do whatever it takes. Yeah. Um, and we see that time and time again. And I often refer back to sport today. You know, self-visualisation in sport has become such a major component. You know, when, when Marks is standing on the edge of the diving board completely composed, you know, and he said to himself, you know, he's completely switched off mm. and he's, he's focusing 100% on that perfect dive. You know, when Johnny Wilkinson's standing there with his fists doing his <laughs> thumbs, yeah, and he's just absolutely focused, mm. well, what is it going to do, that ball picturing it going through the posts? How many of us have taken the time to sit down and think, well, what does that picture of a good life look like? Or, our, you know, what does our farm look like, you yep. know, as, as, a, as a vision, yeah. something to move towards? And again, I think we need, to, we need to really shift away from the farm being the focus. You know, we, the farm is just a resource. It's just a resource to create quality of life for myself, my family, my children, my community. And, you know, once we kind of divorce ourselves from that and treat it as a resource, well, then we say, well, what, what's the farm going to be like to allow me to have mm. these values, these feelings? Because a lot of farmers, I think, you know, it's all about the farm. We pour our money, we pour our energy, we pour our health and, and sometimes our lives into the farm. And we should be saying, well, hold on, the farm's a resource to provide me with quality of life, if I want to feel healthy, inspired, excited about life, how's that farm got to, got to operate, got to function? So is the def- – not a definition, but is one of the, the characteristics of a, of, a, um, of a vision for one's self and one's family, it's, it's actually um, – it, 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 it can be applied to any farm or any situation, any environment that we don't – you know, that it's, it's irrelevant almost – the resource base that we're going to use to 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 achieve it—it's just like you yeah. know, it, it's 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 a standalone concept, isn't it? Yeah, it doesn't matter where you are. I mean, you could be in a in a high rise in the middle of the city. Mm. Um, your decisions, which are based on your on your judgment and your vision, um, will have an impact way beyond the city boundaries. Mm. You know, in terms of the food you buy or who you vote for. Um, all of those things are going to have an impact. And that's that ripple effect, that holistic effect of, you know, we make a decision here, it has those implications further down the track and just appreciating those. So people everywhere, all walks of life, you know, um, we need to somehow get people thinking and making decisions differently because, you know, as I said yesterday, I think, um, you know, humans have evolved basically to react to things. So, you know, if I was walking down the street and I, Bumped you and I said, I think you're an idiot. <laughs> most people. You did that to me the other day. <laughs> outside an airport somewhere. <laughs> most, <laughs> most people. I didn't say you're an idiot. <laughs> most people just react. Yeah. Oh, I think you're an idiot. Yeah. You know, do you want to fight? But if you have this clear vision sitting on your shoulder that says, my community needs to be caring, helpful, diverse, supportive, fun, and someone comes and bumps you in the shoulder mm. and says, I think you're an idiot, how do you now respond? You respond very differently. Is that. Sorry to hear that. Can I help mm, you? It's mm. a very different response. So I think humans have evolved, you know, responding. You know, for, I always say if, if the thing with big teeth and stripes was charging at the forest at you, you know, your whole focus was on Mr. Teeth and Stripes. Mm. You, know, you didn't worry about the cockatoos over there and, and, you know, the clouds over there. But the minute we started managing environments, the minute we started managing, management has that ripple effect. Mm. 
And so whatever we do here, we need to acknowledge, well, hold on, what's the big picture? Consequences. Yeah. Tell me about that. I mean, because you mentioned it was, was it your slide there. You, there was a the the reference to the, um, there's no punishments, there's no rewards. It's just consequences. Was that yours? Or am, no, I, am I mixing them up? No, you're mixing up. That was damn um, it. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a good one. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there was definitely a theme there this morning. I just have to think about it. <laughs> You might have been out of the room getting changed into your Hawaiian shirt. Um, but let's talk about consequences because it's, I think that's the thing. And, and again, I'm, I'm probably muddling up who was saying what as well, but, you know, it might have been actually Terry saying that, um, uh, you know, it, it's, it, it's the consequences that we're, we're, not, we're not being responsible for, yeah. you know, essentially, you know, with, on our farm, with our farm, with our health, with our family's sort of future. Yeah. I think one of the big problems with that is – is again that very linear output, and we assume we're right, and so um, it's really hard to assume that we might be wrong. But when you actually acknowledge the huge complexity of nature, you know that, that, that I look at a slide of soil and I think, my God, you know, there's so much life all buzzing and creeping there, and I don't know what half of them do. Most people wouldn't know, you know, what was happening there. But every single decision we make on that land is going to impact those. Mm. You know, so. We need to also acknowledge that huge complexity and the fact that we'll we'll never understand it. Mm. And so, if 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 there's a complexity there that we don't understand, how on earth do we monitor it? We don't monitor for results. We're always saying to ourselves, "Listen, there's a good chance I'm going to be off track." Mm. You know, um, what do I monitor to make sure I'm on track? And so that was, you know, one of the drivers in in the talk this morning was direction and directions. Mm. You know, if you don't have a clear direction in terms of context or goal or whatever you want to call it, a life goal, um, you know, how do you track the directions? But more importantly, how do you actually monitor you're heading in the right place? And how uh, do the values fit into that? Okay. Uh, for me, values drive every decision you've ever made. You know, we like to think we're logical and, and we, we substantiate our, our feelings with our, well, we probably look at the logic and then substantiate our feelings. <laughs> I'm poking Brian's <laughs> eyes out with a mic. <laughs> He's getting more and more relaxed as we talk, so I've got to follow him around. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you know, uh, every every decision we make, we, lo- we like to think, you know, it's based on logic, but we use that logic to substantiate our feelings. So every decision, and it's, you know, as Simon Seeker points out, it's not about uh, psychology. It's actually biology. So the uh, the limbic part of the brain, the ancient brain, um, that's re- responsible for our decision making and our feelings. So you know, before we developed logic and technology and all those things that flowed from it, we basically made decisions based on feelings. Mm. How are you feeling, and you'd react to that. Mm. Okay. As we developed the neocortex, that outside part, the new Homo sapiens type brain, that evolved for logic and for language. And so that's one of our big problems in getting people to even think about how they're feeling is we can't express them in language. You know, you often say to people, how are you feeling? I don't know, I just don't feel right. (laughs) Or I feel good. You know, we use good as a a blamage word to cover a whole range of things. You know, your dog's just died, you had an accident. How are you feeling, mate? Good. Uh, Because we're told uh, from a very young age, don't express your feelings, don't show your feelings. You know, eat cement, toughen up, don't cry, don't be a wuss. Mm. Um, And that hides, and we put a lot of layers of armour on our feelings, and then you kind of wonder why, well, I suppose it's no surprise why people hurt people they love, uh, destroy the environment that supports them, um, because they're not in touch with the feelings, which then create that connection to the other things that are really important around them. Is that because our head gets in the way? Yeah, to a degree, yeah, yeah. Mm. But it's it's the shallow outside neocortex head. Mm. It's not that deep human head that's all about feelings at the end of the day. We, and that's... Another thing that I, uh, holistic management, when you can get people into that space of actually discovering their feelings and learning about their feelings, it actually brings people together Mm. because there's no one out there who doesn't want to feel loved, doesn't want to feel connected, doesn't want to feel uh, excited about things. So when you focus on those, you can bring people from all walks of life, all religions, uh, it doesn't matter whether cattle farmers, sheep farmers, croppers, they all want the same thing, you know. And I've had wonderful experiences where bringing huge diversity into a room 
And I mean, literally the rooms in the corners because they're all part of a different tribe. And if you can get them to open up and start talking about feelings, mm. you can get them sitting around the table and making really good sound decisions, you know, sound socially, sound financially, sound environmentally, just because all the people are together. We all want to feel the same. So one of the questions I often, you know, poke people with is how do you want to feel when you wake up in the morning? You know, and it's that simple. How I do wanna, you feel when you wake up in the morning? How do you want to feel? How do you want to feel? Yeah. But how do you feel? Oh, I want to feel excited, yeah. stimulated, uh, healthy. Uh, you know, and if we can focus on those things, that becomes the vision that, mm. that draws you along. Mm. Uh, not how I want to feel in the morning. I'll tell you tomorrow after drinks tonight. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do a part two tomorrow. <laughs> like, oh, no. I feel yeah. like crap. Yeah. But I, st- I still know what I want to feel like. And, the, and is, I mean, you know I, it's not the first time it's been said that, you know, the genders have a different approach to, to that. Don't yeah, they? absolutely. Um, and that's probably a good, a good news about it because uh, certainly in my courses, I think just about all the courses that we run at the moment, uh, more than 50% are women. Mm. And uh, again, you're generalizing, but I think a person who has to look after a home um, and look after children and make sure there's food on the table and the kids aren't getting bullied at school and that whole complex uh, home life, there is no end point. Mm. There's no ticking a box saying, job done, tick, let's go home and have a beer. Yep. Okay? No, knock off. Where, yep, whereas, and again, I'm generalizing and I apologize for that, um, the males tend to go off, we've got a job of work to do, we chop down a tree, kill something, we come home, we tick the box, job's done, and tomorrow it's something different. And so men tend to be a lot more linear. Mm. Women tend to be a lot more holistic. And so they, they pick this stuff up generally quite easy. Um, and I suppose then it falls back on, on their role to try and influence the Y chromosome person in the family. Um, and, and they know when the gaps open uh, and to when to put in those new ideas about you know, how, how we're going to operate as a family. It's probably the most important role a human can play, isn't it? You know, really to, to be that catalyst for change, oh, yeah. whether it's around the dinner table, it's in the yards helping, you know, the Y chromosome holder. Um, and thank God they do and they can, you know. Absolutely. And again, I think, you know, because they're in touch with feelings, they can often do it without offending or hurting the person they're trying to change. Because so often, mm. you know, you see people trying to, spread the word, create the change, and they actually offend people. And, again, that's not, that's not taking you anywhere you know, that you want to go. Um, you know, we're all connected at the end of the day. It's, it's not in anyone's interest to offend anybody. Um, you know, you don't know when uh, you might have a flat tire on the road and the person you've just offended who you never knew before just happens to it's drive called, past. And it's instead, of, karma, st- isn't it? instead of stopping, he gives you a finger. <laughs> well, Brian, um, I'm, I'm glad that you're in touch with your feelings and that, that you have, you're here today and you're contributing behind the scenes in, in front of everyone. And I'm really looking forward to us catching up um, in a different forum, a little more relaxed, a little more time to chew the fat. And I'm really keen to do one of your courses as well because I've, I've, you know, I've done the grazing of a profit. I've been circulating in the world of all of this stuff for some time and I'm really keen to just, you know, um, fill a gap, I think, because, yeah. you know, I think the, even Natural Seconds Farming course I did the other day blew my mind. We had it at, at Hannah Minow and, again, it was like, you know, you don't know what you don't know until you get there and you go, oh, my God, this is just another a layer of, Good stuff, you know. Yeah. yeah, and there's so much. Yeah, really. so, yeah, right now we're living in such exciting times. Yeah, it's just huge. Well, I mean, just just the, just the, the the array of speakers and presentations and the people here today. Like, it's just, you know, I said to Tony who before, can we do this every six months? Maybe every quarter, <laughs> maybe every month. He was like, oh, I nearly fell over. <laughs> but I mean, it's it just a, it's a great example of you know what can happen, the momentum and the the passion and the energy, you know, the energy, energy that can huge. be created yeah. from the gathering of, of like yeah. minds. And even, and as you know, I made, we made the point, Tony and I, that, you know, we'd love to see more people here who weren't necessarily on the same page or, or you know, preaching to the converted. That we, let's, you know, how do we, well, that's a question for you. One last one before it gets you to have your lunch <laughs> is, um, you know, how, what, how do we sort of approach, not that we have to approach, but you know, what, what's the key for, for others who are sitting on the fence or ridiculing or anywhere on the on you know that that, that not necessarily in this sort of um, regenerative 
thinking kind of space at the moment. Yeah. What, what do we do? Do I we think, have to do we have to do anything? I think we have to. Mm. Um, you know, as I said yesterday, you can be the most successful regenerative farmer on the planet, but if your neighbours are failing and going backwards, you will fail. Yeah. Mm. Um, we'd like to think that bar by fence is the boundary. It's not. Um, so how do we how do we change people's minds? You know, generally uh, people's minds aren't changed by arguments; they're changed by observations. Mm. And so, you know, doing a lot of what you do, which is getting people out. And if we're talking farmers, you know, I've had amazing people, eye openers, when you get people out in the paddock, down on their hands and knees, looking at that soil surface. And, it, you know, it might be just a question like, you know, how much do you pay for that piece of real estate? And we're looking at a piece of bare, algal capped soil, you know, dead. And, um, you know, often it's just that observation. And if you can just open people's eyes through observation, um, Generally, you don't get any pushback. Mm. Um, you know, um, so creating that and creating that curiosity, isn't yeah, it? It's like yeah. putting it on the table and going, you know, just back off. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> take it and leave it. Yeah, and that's the key. Yeah. Well, not well. What's not just the key? It's one of the keys. Yeah. Um, Brian, you better go and get yourself a little egg sambo. I shall. Um, I'll round up my next victim. <laughs> and really appreciate your time, Brian. And, and let's make sure we catch up um, somewhere else other than an airport. That'll be great. <laughs> thanks, Charles. Thanks, Brian. And thanks for all you do. No worries. Pleasure. Having fun. Okay. Next victim. You are so spivvy now. Look at all this I know. outfit. This is, this is the same kid I had before. You were just, I don't know, you were, you, your observational skills are improving. No, it was diffused with all the trees and, oh, I can hear myself <laughs> coming back. How do I do that? You, I'll just take bad? this off. Take it off if it's too yeah. much. Um, yeah, maybe I'm too better. close. Maybe we're going yeah. to hear a bit. That's better. I'll so, do it like that. if you haven't already worked out, I'm chatting with Rachel Ward, who is who was on um, the Regenerative Journey some time ago. Yeah, that's a bit sort of funny, isn't it? What's going on there? I don't know. It's a bit of feedback. I've taken f- my my yeah. doodars off. It was too loud. Maybe I've got my levels wrong. <laughs> anyway, um, so we're here at the um, Farming Matters Conference, and whilst you're not presenting, you are doing. You're on the panel tonight. I am. Together. Yep. Um, I wanted to just tap in, Rachel, to um, your thoughts on, well, two things. Let's start with what's been happening with you since we, we, we chatted. Because you, we, we chatted in about August last year. Mm. So sort of almost farm. six months ago now, isn't it? At least. Yeah. Uh, oh, what has been happening? So much. I don't know how, <laughs> how to start, really. Um, as it is, you know, on a farm, um, particularly when you're transitioning to regen. It's just never-ending mm. fun and games and running around on motorbikes and, you know, counting grasses and monitoring and getting all excited because you've suddenly found some some new species in there and um, then setbacks and uh, what's going on here. And uh, then we had the rains and we had a lot of erosion. And then the one thing I did think I was pretty good on was my water management. I felt I've got plenty of water, I've got plenty of rain. We have about 1,200 a year, mills a year. That's so, true. you know, we're pretty good in that way. I didn't mm. think really that was my issue. And then we had this rain recently and we've had some major erosion um, and I suddenly realised I have to really deal with my, um, with my, my, my water holding mm. issues really. I have to start looking at holding it higher, getting some wiki, some. We get some, what are they called? Weeky, weeky, weeky leers, weeky, weeky, weeky weirs, weeky weirs. And, yeah, sort of starting to really look at my hydration a little bit more seriously. Mm. Hey, what are you going to do? What, 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 how are you going to do that? What's your plan? Well, it's interesting. I mean, you know, you had the conversation. The, the question I had today was dealing with my, I've always got some little local issue I'm dealing with, which I will um, bore your listeners with, but I've got the camphor laurel issue now where I've got a lot of dead camphor laurels, which the fire did, thanks very much, mm. but they're now recolonizing and re, um, regrowing. So it's now they're at their weakest point, so I've got to do something now or never, otherwise I'm going to have the canopy, the, the thick Camp the laurel canopy again. So what do I do? Um, anyway, I could either, I could put them into big windrows and I could burn them because I've got it. They're just dead trees at the moment and I've mm. got to, got to somehow get to that new growth. Or I could just put them into big piles and put them over the little stream that's running through there mm-hmm. and have a sort of my own little beaver 
leaky weir sort yeah. of scenario. But then that kind of doesn't play into my aesthetic of the whole thing, which is always my conundrum, is which I'm getting my head around a lot. Mm. You know, suddenly a very scruffy paddock, which you know you can tell who are the regen farmers or not because they've got. <laughs> They're not all neatly <laughs> slashed. We've got a bit of wackiness going on. Um, but I did want this gully just to be, you know, this lovely gentle gully with these grey gums in it and this cattle wandering through and my little stream. Mm. Is that but, the one above the dam, your big dam? Is that yes. Up to, the, yeah, that's up right. to the state forest. That's right, exactly, yeah. So anyway, that's I've just, a, you know, we get a little bit obsessed about the actual, the actual, um, uh, challenges that we have of the time, and that happens to be my weak link at the moment and my challenge, which I'm enjoying, obviously. And I took advantage of those boys being up there to uh, ask them the question, what to do. Mm. Was this yesterday? No. What? What I asked it? them the question. No, we heard you, which question did you ask? I asked a question when they had the question and answers, weren't you? Oh, you weren't here. You were obviously up here. Is this just This before? day, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. No, I didn't get that. No, I was interviewing yeah. um, a couple of others. Right, okay. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, less. so uh, that was the question I was asking mm. because I knew, and, and I knew that Brian Wilberg would say, well, go through your t- testing questions and yeah. get your answer. When every time I go through them, I don't get the answer I want, <laughs> so, Is that because your aesthetic overlay is sort of... Yeah, I have to get over that. Yeah. I have to get over that. It's like, you know, in Wilding, in that book that um, Isabel Tree wrote, you have to get over that mm. nature is messy mm. and it isn't all neat boundaries and and footpaths and hedgerows it's actually kind of chaotic and and i'm getting my i am getting my head around that and i'm starting to love the chaoticness of it and the sort of randomness of Mm. it and the sort of um yeah what about reframing reframing what is beautiful yeah exactly Mm. reframing Mm. what is beautiful and of course you have it set in your mind what is beautiful and it comes from years and years of your own culture Mm. And I am really looking at that. So maybe I will start to find that those great big, you know, hunks of dead campers mm. over my stream will actually in the end look beautiful. Because the last time we spoke, it was the other trees that I'd brought down. And now they're, I've thrown Seratro all over them, which is a, which is a wonderful nitrogen-based vine. Yeah. And they have crumbled and they, yeah. are, they are looking fantastic. So can you do the same with the all camper? Logs? Yes, of course I can. But, but as you say, they're, they're potentially an asset, a resource you can use to in, in, the, um, uh, in the repair of an, another asset being your, your, your riparian yes. zone. Yeah, I and, can. And it, maybe it's about, you know, still playing to your aesthetic, um, but it's just the way you place them, that they're practical, but they're also can be quite a beautiful. Yeah, there's, little, a, he- there's a, lot a lot of, of them. them. That's the trouble. It's like four hectares were worth of camphor laurels. So if anyone out there wants some camphor laurels to build some new shelves, know where you can get them. Breadboards. Yeah, bread oh, There's a hell know, of a lot blanket, of breadboards. Blanket um, boxes. Yep, there's that too. That was the there's original real, year, wasn't that's it? That's true. One of the original? That's yeah, true. But who moths. wants a blanket box now? <laughs> Not too a many duna, queuing up for that a one. Duna box. Yeah, Duna box. Okay, <laughs> done. Um, oh, we could talk for hours about that. I mean, the, the, the thing that you got me thinking about just then was um, we, a couple of weeks ago we hosted a natural sequence farming course with Stuart and Peter Andrew, yes. Andrews. Which, and when you said keeping the the, 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 the water, the, the you know, rehydrating the landscape higher up in the landscape yeah. and so it doesn't yeah. all drain out and go down yeah. and erode, you know, for me that was a total eye-opener, not the concept of, you know, retaining water, but the method and the and the and the you know the I guess the the practice of what do you actually do? Well, you know, for them it's a mechanical, okay, which I always had a bit of a thing about, like I don't want a bloody dozer or an excavator or whatever. But what I now understand is, you know, we as humans have 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 um, damaged this 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 landscape, and we can wait, and it shall it will take some time for us using the tools of cattle and sheep. And, mm. and, and manage grazing to rehydrate the landscape to a point where it was somewhere near where it used to be. Mm-hmm. If we choose to do it quicker, um, mm-hmm. basically mm-hmm. with mechanics, um, which I'm sort of getting my head around, we can achieve that immediately once they have done in terms of its, you know, the, right. the sort of succession of, um, uh, of fertility cycling and rehydrating the landscape. You know, water being the most limiting fat, um, resource, we, we have plenty of right. sunshine. Yeah. So that's interesting. So, I mean, I'll, I'm just suggesting look into that because that might yeah. be, you know, another layer of, of, of practice that 
No, it would be good. I just, I have a hell of a lot of it. I mean, it's in a, and Terry, I put the question to Terry McCosker. He, he said, you know, the fire is part of our tools. And um, as long as I'm then going to use the land for, you know, building carbon, mm. which is exactly what I would be doing with it, mm. um, you know, there's sometimes there's a place for burning. Put, a, put, put a, a match in yeah, it. Yeah, putting, putting a match in it. And I think the important thing, as you've done with the, um, what did you put on there, Seratro? No. Seratro, yeah, yeah. But it is getting that covered because the, the, the camphor is there to try and cover the ground. That's what, you know, you take out all that scrub, you know, I'm talking centuries yes. ago, you know, and camphor went, oh, I've got a job yes, to do now. Yes. You know, if one can cover that soil and replace the need for camphor to be there and for it to regrow, uh, Martin Royds, who is here at the conference, you know Martin. Yes, you need to I do. Martin. Yep. So he has a he's a he has a block. I hope you don't you won't mind me saying so. He's a block on the Northern River somewhere, um, you know, sixty or so acres and forty acres maybe. And he had camphor everywhere. And over the period of about twenty years, he's been replanting rainforest species. And he is seeing camphor dying mm. without poisoning because it is not needed there anymore because of the rainforest. Species regeneration and the and the love and the care and the nurturing. Jeez, he must be old. He's actually moving. <laughs> he must be really old. You know, he practices biodynamics. He's actually 110. Yes, he must be. <laughs> Jesus, that's way. I'm way too impatient for that one. Rainforest trees, come on. No, we- <laughs> yeah, get them. No, back. I've got some great, great grey gums. They're in mm. there. They're just being smothered by the campfires. Damn those camphor. Yep. Hey, um, we're at Aubrey. Um, if we haven't already mentioned that, and. What are your? What's your impression? Well, okay. Without being accused of, of, of favoritism, any standout um, little gold nuggets that you've you've unearthed today were 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 were, were put on the table today for us us the the attendees. Look, um, I've just become such a fangirl of so many of the of of the people who are up there speaking. Lorraine Gordon, Terry McCosker. I mean, I've never met Terry before, and I've been listening to him a lot on online and on podcasts, and I have to say I'm <laughs> such a fan of, of just he has done so much to advance, um, you know, biodiversity, biological farming, holistic farming. He's done so much for addressing our issues, our ecological edi- issues and our biodiversity issues, and dare I say it, the climate change issues, it all rolls into one. Mm. He is just, I mean, he's been in it for a long time, my God, he was an early adopter. I just am so in awe of those people who recognised there was a problem a long time ago and have been in the have been in this you know this area addressing all you know getting to the bottom of these problems. I mean, I'm just reading for the first time. I can't believe it. Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. This has been going a long time. We've been aware of these problems and what we've been doing with. Um, with our biocides and stuff for a very long time and crushing out our biodiversity. And, you know, I mean, Richard Attenborough said it only the other day at the end of his, of his latest program, he said, our greatest threat is losing our biodiversity. Mm. Now these guys have been Walter Jen. They've all been at the cutting edge of this, the, you know, and as Charlie Massey says, the data is there. The blueprint is there despite the fact that a lot of people are so fearful and use that as the fact that we don't have the data, we don't have the blueprint, you know, what is really adding, what facts are adding up, it is there. They do have it. Mm. Um, and it's just waiting for us to really get in there and pick it up. Thank God they are so patient. They are extraordinarily Years patient. Do you get that after a while? Have you gotten the patient bug yet? Uh, I'm waiting for it. Yeah, I'm, I'm patient because I, I guess I'm not, I'm not putting too much expectation on 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 people, so I'm not sort of not that I'm not aiming high, but I, I guess I'm I'm just putting what I'd like to do as many people do is put things on the table, don't bash people in the head with it, and say so that, that's there, and hopefully that incites some curiosity, and then yeah. they pick it up and they run with it. But you're right, those um, elder statesmen, if I can, if yeah. if I can mm. use that expression, um, in Australia and and, and around the world, um, and they are right. Rock stars in our totally. world. There's no question. Totally. I mean, I feel the same thing about meeting Terry McCosker as I as I felt meeting Marlon Brando all those years ago. You know, my heart started he racing. Isn't that hear. ridiculous? He, Terry would love to hear. Oh, that. I told him Terry's more I handsome. Was, I was the. He's got a better mustache. 
<laughs> no, I'm, perf- I'm perfecting my role as fangirl, as major cheerleader to the squad. I'm just an ageing cheerleader. Oh, stop it. Now, um, let's talk about one of your projects. Tell us about the the um, Standing on the Solution, your... your uh, my documentary. Yeah, doco. Yeah, well, it's that. getting there. Um, we have uh, Screen Australia funding now. We have... Uh, a lot of private funding. We are. Um, we have Mad Men as our distributor. We have Regen Studios with Damon Gamu and Anna Kaplan, who are doing our Impact Deck, and um, you know, really coming up with some fabulous ways of uh, of making of having an impact with a documentary. Mm-hmm. It's not like it's there in the cinemas for like one week and then gone. Uh, like a lot of Australian films, it has an opportunity to really reach target audiences, to, you know, to get into education, to, um, to be a catalyst, a big catalyst for change. And you need, a, you need a very comprehensive impact production in order to get that done. So there's not only f- am I raising f- funding for the film, I'm also raising funding for the impact side. And that, you know, is taking time because, as you know, I met with you at least a year ago and was, we did a lot of interviews. Last year, yeah. And then I basically had to get real and <laughs> actually start <laughs> putting the real pieces together mm. and really getting the funding and really, you know, there's no point, there's no point lassoing all you guys and then it just, you know, sitting on the sitting, sitting yeah, yeah, going, being in the cinemas for one minute and, and racing out the next. So just need to, I'm still raising the money, but we're very close. We're very close mm. to getting back on the road again and to filming. And anybody who's, who understands the importance of actually getting this message out to the average consumer so that people know the power they have with their dollar, that they can choose to buy food that is being, that is being generated, raised by people who put the soil and the ecology first. So, um, you know, and there are those out there and it is out there whether you get your um, your community box or whether you go to Harris Farm and buy, go to the region sector or whether you go to Provenir or um, we have in Sydney, we have um, your friends. Um, Which ones? Uh, Feather and Bone. Feather and Bone. Feather yeah. and bone. Grand you know, Laura. there are people out mm. there who are doing – who are really doing some incredible things with the land mm. and we need to let people know that. So that is really where the documentary comes in to sort of just edu- educate really people or entertain people or whatever mm. to understand that there is an alternative to the way we've been farming for many years, which as they were saying today, he's basically got rid of 70% of our carbon that is now in the air comes from agriculture. And we tend to believe that it's from burning fossil fuels, but, you know, and that's been the excuse all along for us farmers who've been, um, who've been doing the wrong thing and we need to wake up and actually really um, address where a lot of that carbon is coming from, that unwanted carbon, and mm. get it back, get it recycling. Um, so that's one way of doing it, getting information out there, and that's what I'm trying to do. So if anybody out there thinks... <laughs> That they need to support that. They can go to DAF, DAF, D-A-F, which is the Documentary Australia Foundation. So it's tax deductible. Yeah, cool. Any amount will be a great help. Mm. And um, come on board this wonderful journey. I've just been on it and I've I've never been so, um, what's the word, more than excited, kind of uh, just I feel very hopeful. I feel that that there is a hope. I'm not sure we'll actually rise to the occasion, but there is a hope, there is an answer to our conundrums out there. We just have to know about it. And I think people will, will, will grab it once they do. Which is what this conference is all about, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, even though most of the people there are sort of in the space already, um, I think that it's, mm. it's beholden on them to get out to the world and be inspired by what they've heard and then, you know, just have those conversations. But I also think it's important for those in this world, that we actually re-energize each other, mm. re-inspire each other, re, you know, network, get more information. I mean, I'm just topped up already, and we're only halfway through the day. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I think it's um, no, it's a, it's it's wonderful for us and for anybody else thinking of coming into this this place, this arena. We've been told not to say space because it's yeah, no, so, I, I, I I've, I've, I've used that a lot. But um, anyway, it's a wonderful world. I'm hey, enjoying it. Well, I'm glad you're in this world, um, Rachel, because you bring a whole different sort of perspective um, and your enthusiasm and your creativity and your passion for this that mm. is clearly 
given you another, I don't know. No, serious lease on life. No, yeah. I'm not going to stand back from yeah. that. It really has given me a huge lease on life at the age of 60 to feel, A, to have this sort of um, tribe that I mm. love and I'm so interested in, and I'm so interested in this conversation about how we fix our problems, our mm. ecological problems, which is the most important conversation that we can be having today. Well, I'm glad you're having the conversation. Thank you for your time. I'm glad you're on the team. And Thanks, let's, Charlie. we've got another half a day of this to um, enjoy. Yeah, and a dinner I tonight. Yeah. And a chat. And panel a chat. session tonight. A, yeah, good one. Looking we'll forward to that. We'll be run out by then, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Rachel. Well, look, I hope you enjoyed that one. Uh, I certainly did, uh, putting it together, sitting there, shuffling people around. Um, it actually worked really well. Uh, not too organised, but it just seemed to all fall together. So that was part one. Uh, part two coming up next week. We've got um, Sam Johnson, Boxgum Grazing, David Marsh. Uh, you've heard a number of times on the podcast. Wonderful uh, mentor of mine and, and uh, good buddy here at Borowa. Uh, Courtney McGregor, who's the sustainability officer at Harris Farm, who played a big role in the um, in the, the Land of Market Conference in terms of sponsors, sponsoring the, the evening, the first um, first gathering on the first e- evening of the conference and also um, a big, big, big footprint now in the regenerative agriculture space with their uh, uh, Tour on the Soil campaign, which I'm involved in and loving that role. And then um, Harry Youngman, who um, I'll tell you all about him in part two, of course, but he's very interesting Farmer, entrepreneur, you probably hate me telling, saying that, but uh, he certainly is. Investor, just a all around good guy. So um, you got that to look forward to in part two next week. This podcast is produced by Reese Jones at Jaeger Media. If you enjoyed this episode, please feel free to subscribe, share, rate, and review. For more episode information, please head over to www.charliearnett.com.au.